Understanding how the world's oceans work is of extreme importance to many businesses as well as the public. However, there is little information provided for members of the public on the ins and outs of how processes such as tides or how waves are formed. Further knowledge of these processes can help lead to the public being safer around the marine environment as well as providing a pathway for younger members of the public to help harness and protect this environment for years to come. Waves on the surface of the ocean are created by the disturbance of an otherwise flat surface. These waves are generated by the action of two opposing forces, the disturbing force and the restoring force. The disturbing force causes the surface of the sea to change its elevation by a certain amount, i.e. wind travelling across the water surface. The restoring force is the opposing force which restores the elevated sea back to its original state of rest. However, these two forces don't just start and stop. The momentum of water being restored back to its resting state results in water flowing past its original placement, creating an oscillating surface and therefore resulting in a surface wave. Waves caused by, via wind blowing across the sea surface can take many forms and are named wind waves, which are the most common type of wave around the world. One major influence on the production of waves is low pressure systems, which is simply a cell of air that's pressure is lower than the air surrounding it. Due to the force of Coriolis, which is caused by the Earth's rotation, pulling air counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere, surface air becomes swirling and fast moving, generating waves by energy transfer from air to water. The larger the pressure difference between the centre of the low pressure system and the surrounding air, the higher the speed of the surface air. This in turn imparts more energy onto the surface water, creating bigger waves. The first waves formed from the wind blowing across the sea's surface are capillary waves, with a wavelength of less than 1.73 centimetres. The wavelength of a wave is the distance between the same parts of two consecutive waves. However, wavelength is only relevant when there are successive waves, not a solo wave. If the wind blowing over the ocean's surface is continuous, the smaller capillary waves will continue to gain energy from the wind blowing against the slight incline of the capillary wave. This results in the waves growing much larger and exceeding the 1.73 cm wavelength of capillary waves due to the restoring force no longer being dominated by the tension of the surface, but by gravity. This is the transition of a capillary wave to a gravity wave. Similar to the capillary wave, when gravity waves fall due to gravity, the momentum of the wave forces it to shoot past its original spot, creating an oscillating wave, which in conjunction with a blowing wind, moves a wave forward, resulting in a progressive wave. When waves travel over the surface of the ocean, the waves do not transport water from one position to another, like ocean currents. They simply transfer energy. When looking at gravity waves, it is apparent that water particles don't just move up and down, but actually move in a near-perfect circle, called a wave orbital. At the crest of a wave, the water particles are moving forward in the same direction the wave is travelling, and then in the trough, the water particles move backwards and return to their original starting point, completing a near-perfect circle as a wave travels. This repeats with every wave that travels through. In deep water, wave orbitals continue to transfer energy beneath the surface. However, the diameter of these orbitals reduces quickly and are non-existent by the time they reach the seabed. A deep water gravity wave is a wave that is in water deeper than half of the wave's wavelength. The bottom does not interfere with the wave orbitals. Speed or velocity of propagation of a deep water wave is 1.25 times the square root of the wavelength. Depth is not included in this equation because friction impedes it and speed is reduced. When the depth of the ocean is less than 1 20th of the wavelength of the wave, this then becomes a shallow water gravity wave. The wave orbitals of a shallow water gravity wave become ellipsis shaped with depth, causing the wave to lose energy and slow down. In water, with a depth shallower than half the wavelength of a wave, the bottom of the ocean becomes increasingly important in controlling the speed of the wave. When a wave front travels at different speeds over water of different depths, it refracts. This is a bending of the wave front. When part of a wave moves slower than another, the wave bends towards the slower part of the wave. The wave always bends towards shallow water, as this is where the wave travels most slowly. To calculate the amount of refraction, you can use Snell's law. Waves also diffract when passing obstacles such as a harbour or a jetty. As a wave hits an obstacle, the end of the wave is effectively separated, but continues to propagate around the object as a circular wave originating from a point. This basically leads to a wave curling around the end of an obstruction. Every wave has a different profile, and knowing the profile of a wave can be very important at times. Over time, researchers have conducted many experiments, resulting in three, sometimes four in different papers, different types of breaker. These brake types are the spilling breaker, a wave that breaks very slowly with little power and no tube, the plunging breaker, a more powerful spilling breaker, and 
can have a possible tube, making it better for surfing. The surging breaker, which surges up and down the beach without breaking, and the collapsing breaker, which is a middle point between the surging and plunging breakers. However, realistically, there is no actual figure for how many types of breaker there are, but a continuing variation of all wave profiles. Researchers developed the Irobaran number to classify the varying breaker types according to wave height, wave period, and the beach slope. Surface currents are the result of energy transferred from the sun via the wind onto the world's oceans. When taking into account the Earth's rotation and the wind blowing across the ocean's surface, Coriolis starts to have an effect on the surface current, forcing it right in the northern hemisphere and left in the southern hemisphere. This causes a surface layer of water to flow at a 45 degree angle to the wind, as shown by the arrows showing wind and coast on screen now. Below this surface layer, Coriolis force comes into play again and deflects the deeper water layers further to the right, continuing in a downward spiral for a limited depth. This is known as an Ekman spiral. Ekman spirals are a major influence on the circulation of water in the depth of the world's oceans and are responsible for major ocean dyes. The constant surface winds cause a build-up of water in an ocean basin, which is continually filled with water by Ekman currents, leading to a pile of water in the centre of the basin. This water can only reach a certain height and therefore sinks at a constant rate and is replaced by the surface Ekman current. The water that sinks via downwelling is pushed away from directly underneath the central point in the basin by the surface Ekman current. And as the new water pushes the older water away, it causes upwelling to occur. Due to the salinity of seawater, it is far more dense than fresh water. This, paired with the differing temperatures, can have an effect on the sinking of water in the world's oceans. Colder water is more dense than warmer water, and with continued cooling at the surface of the Earth's ocean, this leads to cool water consistently sinking, creating a cooler column of water. So basically, as temperature increases, density decreases, and as salinity increases, density decreases. Looking at a range of data for temperature and salinity can produce a TS profile, temperature salinity profile, which plots constant density over a range of temperatures and salinities. These differences in water density can result in layering, which can be measured using devices such as conductivity, temperature and depth system, a CTD. In coastal locations with runoff from rivers and other sources, it can cause surface water that is warmer and less saline than a deeper, colder, more saline water, creating a halocline, separating the two. Firmer halines are a change in water temperature at depth, which can sometimes be felt when swimming in a sea or lake. Density also drives the currents of the deep water in the world's oceans, called density-driven Fermi haline circulation. The cooler water from areas such as the Antarctic and Arctic sink due to being more dense, and due to TS profiles that can trace characteristics of water from certain areas, it becomes apparent that this cool water is from areas such as the Antarctic and Arctic, and is travelling very slowly in currents across the deep ocean floor, as you can see on screen now. This deep firmer haline circulation is sometimes referred to as a great ocean conveyor belt, as being drawn on screen now, which is controlled by surface circulation and density in bottom waters. Over time, many researchers have developed tidal theories to help us be able to tell what the tide will be like in any location at any time. One of these tidal theories is the equilibrium theory, which was developed in the 17th century by Sir Isaac Newton and was based on many assumptions that we now know are unrealistic. However, the theory is still incredibly useful for understanding the basics of tides. This theory relies on the Earth-Moon system, where both the Earth and the Moon revolve around a point called the barycenter. This revolution is responsible for two tidal bulges, one on the side facing the Moon and the other on the opposite, and gives most places in the world two tides a day. These tides are also the result of two forces, the gravitational force between the Earth and the Moon and the inertial force. The side of the Earth facing the Moon has a stronger gravitational pull than the inertial force, and the side opposite facing away from the Moon has less gravitational pull than the inertial force. If the Earth was soft like a sponge, it would stretch towards the Moon on the side facing and stretch away on the opposite. However, due to the Earth being covered by water, the water is pooled and causes two bulges on either side of the Earth. The relationship between the Earth, Moon and Sun also creates spring and neap tides. Spring tides are when the tidal range is at its maximum, high highs and low lows, and neap tides are when the tidal range is at its minimum, low highs and high lows. This is due to the position of the Sun and the Moon. If they are in conjunction or opposition, spring tides, the bulges caused are lined up and therefore results in two larger bulges. For neap tides, the Moon is at a right angle to the Sun and the bulges are at angles as well as we work against each other, causing smaller tidal bulges. 
Due to the need of being able to predict the tides in different locations around the world, a man called Pierre-Simon Laplace introduced a dynamic tidal theory. This theory takes into account the effect land masses have on the tides, as well as both Coriolis and the finite depth of the world's oceans. If you take into account the basics from equilibrium tidal theory, the two tidal bulges that move across the Earth's oceans can be slowed down by differing depths. When these tidal bulges reach land mass, they also reflect back off the land instead of travelling over it. The bulges are also deflected by Coriolis. The fact the Earth is moving has a great impact on the water in the world's oceans and makes the tidal waves swirl around amphidromic points as seen on screen now around the UK. In a large ocean basin, the water motion beneath a tidal wave is large enough to be deflected by the force of Coriolis. Due to this force, in the northern hemisphere where the water that would usually travel back and forth is also now continually deflected to the right, meaning that at the centre of a basin there is little movement but at the edge of the basin there is a wave swirling round. There is a system of complex amphidromic systems across the Earth's oceans, with co-tidal lines showing a consistent tidal level between two points. Each line is one hour apart, and every amphidromic point has 12 co-tidal lines. If it is high tide at one co-tidal line, at the line six along from this will be to low tide. The world's oceans are a huge part of the Earth's systems, meaning that climate change can, and is, having a negative impact on this environment with many researchers wondering what the future looks like for the marine environment and how it can help the planet in the present and not so distant future. Climate change can lead to changes in tides and currents and researchers are now trying to predict these changes to help plan for the long term. These predictions rely heavily on how much CO2 is stored in the world's oceans, which is aided by the conveyor belt mentioned earlier, which helps to sequester carbon in a deep sea instead of the world's atmosphere. It is so clear that action is needed to protect this earth and its systems against the impacts of climate change. However, knowing what needs to be done and how to achieve this is still unknown, which is why making this topic more accessible to the public is of increased importance.